Welcome back everyone. In part one of our full ANN regression code along series of lectures, we're mainly going to be dealing with reading in the data and then dealing with feature engineering based off of the longitude and latitude column features as well as the date time column features. All right, let's go ahead and jump to the notebook. Let's go ahead and begin with some imports. I'm going to import torch and then import torch.nn as nn, whoops. And then we'll also be using maybe some NumPy. We'll import pandas as pd. And then I will also import matplotlib.pyplot as plt and matplotlib inline. So first thing we're gonna do is read in our taxi fares data set. We already had, we already went ahead and got 120,000 records for you. So we'll say df is equal to pd read csv and then underneath our data folder you can find nyc taxifares.csv. You should be able to tab autocomplete this. Once you read it in, go ahead and check out the head of the data set. So here we can see the actual features. First, we have a pickup date time. Note that this is a full date timestamp. So we're gonna have to be able to use some feature engineering to grab features off of this. Next, we have fare underscore amount. That's the actual dollar amount that was spent on the fare. Later on in the next series of lectures, we're gonna treat this as a classification problem of below or above a certain amount. So that's where fare class comes into play. We'll show you uh, in a next series of lectures how we would treat this as a classification problem. So we're actually going to ignore fare class for this series of lectures because we're treating this right now as a regression problem, trying to predict the exact amount. But later on, we'll kind of swap some things out and show you how you can deal with this as a classification problem. That way, you know how to deal with both regression and classification problems on your own data sets. Next, we move on to the main features, which are pickup longitude, pickup latitude, drop off longitude, drop off latitude, and then the actual number of passengers on that ride. If you check out our lecture notebook that goes along with the series of lectures, we actually have the Kaggle project linked for you. It's called the New York City Taxi Fare Prediction Problem. You can go ahead and check out a description of this. If you click on the data tab here, it'll give you more descriptions on these data fields, etc. And if you just click overview, there's also uh, other people's data exploration notebooks you can explore. Okay, so we're gonna come back to our notebook right now, and let's go ahead and actually check out a description. So we'll say fair amount, and we're gonna say describe, which gives us some statistics. So we have 120,000 records here. It looks like the mean fair amount is around $10, with a standard deviation of $7.5, where the minimum fair amount was $2.50, and the maximum fare amount was almost $50. And then we can see the quartiles, 25, 50%, and 75%. Next, what we wanna do is really think about some feature engineering here. Right now, we only have direct longitudes and latitudes. And if you were to train the network on the direct longitudes and latitudes, you would notice that it doesn't actually perform that well. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is because it's kind of difficult to interpret a direct longitude and latitude. Another reason for that is because within just New York City, there's not gonna be extreme changes in longitude and latitude, especially for shorter trips. And we can see here, we're dealing with our particular data set just around a $10 trip, which isn't a trip that's very long, which means if you take a look at these longitude changes, the longitude, the actual significant digits where you'd have to actually start seeing changes um, is pretty extreme. It's beyond just these two decimal places. So some of these, if you're only to look at these first four digits, they would look exactly the same between the pickup locations and even the drop-off locations. So if you look at the drop-off locations, you can see these are still at 73.9 something. So that difference is an issue for us. And what would probably be a better feature to actually take into account is the distance between the pickup points and the drop-off points. And for that, we'll need to actually figure out how we calculate the distance traveled from two sets of GPS coordinates. And if you check out again our notebook that we provide for you, or you can just Google around, you can check out the Wikipedia page on this. And it's called the Haversine formula. Let me expand this window for you. So the Haversine formula determines the distance between two points on a sphere given their longitudes and latitudes. So we can treat the globe as a sphere and then calculate that using the Haversine formula. So if you scroll down here, there's the full formulation. And what we went ahead and did for you is eventually you wanna figure out D, which is the distance. And it's this giant formula 
which actually isn't too bad to translate into Python. You just need to know where to call NP sign and how to call NP radians. So we use a lot of NumPy for this. I'm going to go ahead and copy our Python version of this formula and then kind of walk through it for you. But you could just have done a Google search and figure out the Haversign formula and then translate this formula into NumPy. So let's go ahead and show this. I'm going to come back to my notebook and I'm going to copy and paste the function for the Haversign distance. And this is being copied and pasted from our lecture notebook. So here we have the Haversign distance. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take in the data frame and then we're going to take in latitude at point one, longitude at point one, essentially the pickup point, latitude at point two, and longitude at point two, the drop off point. And then we need to figure out the radius of the Earth. So we're going to state that the average radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometers. Technically, the radius uh, changes depending on if you're looking towards the equator or the poles, but for our use case, this average amount is fine. Then we'll go ahead and convert those latitude and longitude measurements into radians using numpy.radians. And then we have our phi1 and phi2, again, just getting these calculations from that Wikipedia article. And then we'll go ahead and calculate the differences between the latitudes and the longitudes translate those into radians, and then we have our deltas, delta phi and delta lambda, and then we plug all those in to that sine formula, and then this is essentially breaking up that formula that we just saw into A, C, and then we get back our distance, where we have the radius times C, and we get back D in kilometers. So let's go ahead and check this out. I'm going to run this formula, and if that was a little too quick for you, you can always just re review the Wikipedia article and see how each of these connects with the portions of that formula in the Wikipedia article. But that way we don't kind of spend too much time just typing out the art, the equation itself into NumPy. What I want to do then is create a new column. And I will call this distance underscore kilometers. And we'll set that equal to the Haversine distance. We're going to pass in our data frame. And then note here the way we're actually calling latitude, longitude, we're calling those inside of the data frame. So this should be a string that matches up with the column names. So let's go ahead and provide those column names. One kind of quick way to do this, I'm going to comment this out, is to call df columns. And here we have the string codes that we're looking for. So we want first the pickup points, and we first want the pickup latitude. So latitude at point one. So we'll go ahead and say pickup latitude. Let's copy that one, paste it in. And then we want the pickup longitude. So copy that one, paste it in. And then we want the, if we take a look again, latitude two and longitude two. So the drop off latitude, copy that one, paste it in. And finally the drop off longitude, copy that one, and then also paste it in. And what this should do for us is it'll return D, where D is essentially a series containing the distance in kilometers for all those rows. So we go ahead and run that. We check out the head of our data frame. And now, all the way at the end, we've gone ahead and created this new feature, distance in kilometers. And this is what feature engineering is. It's taking the existing features you already have and engineering or creating a new feature that is hopefully more useful than the original features. And when I was working on this problem, I went ahead and trained on the already existing longitude and latitude and tried feeding these into our network just uh, in their raw data format. And I was getting poor results until I actually converted them using feature engineering into this distance in kilometers. And you can see here, these values are much more distinct. And as you can imagine, there's probably gonna be an extremely high correlation between the distance traveled in kilometers versus the fare you pay. So it's much more useful to be able to feature engineer the distance in kilometers versus just providing the raw longitude and latitude points. So we went ahead and did that. And again, we just used the Haversine distance formula. You could have also done this using a dot apply instead of passing it into the entire series. It's up to you how you actually want to work with pandas in order to apply this formula. But we've gone ahead and perform our first feat of feature engineering. Next, what we have to do is perform some more feature engineering, but we'll go ahead and do it on the date time column. If we take a look at our data frame right now, by saying df info, 
right now we have this pickup date time object. And right now it's just an object that is essentially being treated as a string. So what I want to do first is convert that into a date time object. So we'll say df. And let's make sure that's a string. Pick up date time is equal to, and we can convert a string into a specific date time object by saying pd to date time. And then we'll go ahead and just pass in the same column. We'll say df pick up date time. So we run that. Again, this may take a little bit of time since there's 120,000 records. As you can imagine, this would take a really long time if you actually had 55 million records or whatever the original was. But now we'll go ahead and say df info, run that. And you should see now we have this date time object. So now that this is a date time object, using uh, a pandas, or excuse me, a Python date time object, we can extract things like hours, AM or PM, or the weekday. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's go ahead and grab the, let's actually grab just the head of the data frame so we can explore this a little bit. So here we see the pickup date time. Now you'll notice that it's no longer a string, but truly a date time, it's already formatted that way. Then what we'll go ahead and do is, let's just grab one row of this, or actually just one value, we'll say pickup date time. So that's a single timestamp right here. Let's go ahead and grab it off zero. Notice this is a Panda series now. And this is a single timestamp. So let's go ahead and explore what we can do with this. We'll say my time. And this is just to explore what we can extract. So often you'll be kind of playing around, especially with date time objects, you are, what you have the ability to extract. So after you define my time, you should be able to do a dot here, hit tab, and you can see there's already a lot of information. There's things like day of the week, day of the year, days and month, etc. So is your end, is your start. You can do uh, things like grab the nanosecond, grab just the hour, etc. And if you do this, it'll end up returning back those objects as attributes. So here's where I would really encourage you to think about what things you think are going to be important. And this sometimes takes a little bit of domain experience and domain knowledge. But what things you think are important due to the date time stamp of the pickup and try to actually extract those features because a neural network is not going to be able to understand this date time object just put in straight. Instead, what we need to do is do some feature engineering to actually extract those. So we'll go ahead and show you some examples of uh, things you could extract from this object, this date time stamp object. Now, before we continue extracting these features, there's something important that we need to note. Recall that all of these taxi rides are occurring within New York City, which is on Eastern Standard Time. But if we take a look back at this pickup date timestamp, right now it's under UTC, which actually means there's a four hour difference because due to our data, it's also falling in April. And so if you take a look at some of these timestamps, actually let's just call df.head, these timestamps are occurring in April of 2010. And that actually occurred during daylight savings time. So there's a time delta or difference in time of four hours between this timestamp and the actual time it was in New York City when this pickup actually happened. So while this time is technically true, the there's a four hour difference for the actual passenger riding on the car. That's important because it lets us know things like if it was AM or PM. So we're gonna have to take that into account. So let's go ahead and make sure that when we're calculating these things, we'll have an adjusted date by four hours. And one way we can easily do that is by simply creating a new column. We'll say DF EDT date. So that Eastern time will be equal to DF at pickup time and we'll go ahead and subtract PD dot a time delta, and we'll say hours is equal to four. So this is a calculation we made based on the fact that in April 2010, it was daylight savings time, and that EDT is then an additional three hours uh, difference from this time right here. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run that. And then what we're gonna do is grab the attributes that we previously talked about, things like hours, etc. So there's different ways we can do this. And there's also lots of different attributes you can grab. We'll first grab an hour by saying DF 
edt date. And then one fast way to do this with pandas is by saying dt dot hour. Next one we're going to do is another one indicating whether it was AM or PM. And there's lots of different ways we can do this, but one way we can do it is if you check out what the hour column looks like. So if I rerun DF head and scroll all the way to the right, I now have that hour column I defined. Basically, it's from zero to 2400 hours. So for AM or PM, I'm looking to see whether or not this item is greater than 12. So one way to do that is by using NumPy and it's where functionality. You could also use a custom function and then use dot apply. There's many, many, many different ways you could do this with pandas and NumPy. So don't think of this as the only way you could do this. But one way we could do that is by saying df hour greater than 12. So basically we are asking NP, hey, where is df hour greater than the 12? And if you do shift tab here, you check the condition and then it's gonna return either X or Y, depending on that condition. Um, X if it's true, and then Y if it's false. So one thing we can do here is, if I actually change this to be less than, and kind of the order doesn't matter depending on how you label X and Y, but I will say, if DF hour is less than 12, then I have my true condition. So my true condition there will say then it's AM. If DF hour is greater than 12, I'll go ahead and label it PM. And if you switched less than for greater than, you would just switch AM and PM. You can always check the documentation on NPWare by doing shift tab and you can check out what it returns and then also links to various examples here. Okay, so lots of documentation there for you to check out. Basic idea of what this is doing is it's just checking this hour column. If it's less than 12, AM or PM column will have the string AM. If it's greater than 12, AM or PM column will have the string PM. Let's go ahead and run that one, check our new head, and then go all the way to the right. And here we now have AM or PM. And it looks like it's matching up four, 11, seven. Those are all AMs, 17 and 22. Those should both be PM. So that's matching up per perfectly. Okay, finally, let's go ahead and check if it was a weekday or weekend. Again, lots of different ways we can do this, but one kind of simple way is to use Panda's date time tools that are built in. And you can always check the documentation on Panda's website for dealing with date times. They have really extensive documentation online on how to do all these operations. But we'll go ahead and grab from our EDT date column. We'll say DT, and then we'll grab STRF time, and then percent sign A. And essentially what that does is if we check out the head of that data frame, this is a special code that we can grab off the string representation for that date time. And then we can see here that it returns back the actual weekday, Monday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, so we can see the actual day of the week. Another way to do that if you wanted to is recall there's different things like dot day of week. So for instance, I could have said if we say dt dot and then call day of week here, run that. This will return back, if we scroll all the way down, a number for that weekday, which then you could map to an actual string. But for right now, we'll stick with the way we did it to actually get that string code. And we'll say, again, strf time, percent sign a. And if you're thinking of a different way you could do this, that's totally okay too. Pretty much for these different feature engineerings we did off the date time column, there's tens of different ways you could do it for each of these operations. So there's many, many ways. No way is incorrect or correct. Um, some are gonna be slightly faster than others, so you might wanna keep that in mind. But here you can see that we essentially were able to feature engineer off this date time, the Eastern date time, then grab the hour, AM or PM or weekday. And notice now we have categorical variables, AM or PM, and then Monday, Saturday, Sunday, etc. So we're then gonna have to deal with these categorical strings to feed them into our network. So coming up next in part two, we're gonna separate the categorical from the continuous columns. I'll see you there.